Good evening. My name is Leah Diggs, and I'm a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues at Dickinson College. On behalf of the Clark Forum, Dickinson College, the Office of Diversity Initiatives, the Office of Institutional and Diversity Initiatives, the Women's Center, and the Department of Sociology, I would like to welcome all of you to tonight's event entitled Trayvon Martin and the Political Imagination. On Sunday, February 26, 2012, police found 17-year-old Trayvon Martin shot dead in Sanford, Florida. 28-year-old George Zimmerman stood above Trayvon with a gun in hand, allegedly with a bloody nose and a wound on the back of his head. Zimmerman claimed he acted in self-defense under Florida's Stand Your Ground statute. After questioning Zimmerman, police released him. News of this tragedy spread and garnered national attention. By March 23rd, the Change.org online petition received over 1.5 million signatures in support of the arrest of Zimmerman. Hoodies on the Hill and the Million Hoodie March captured national headlines. On April 11th, Florida Special Prosecutor Angela Kersey charged Zimmerman with second degree murder and placed him under arrest. He has since been released on bond and is currently awaiting trial. Our speaker for this evening is Dr. Lester Spence, an assistant professor of political science and Africana studies at Johns Hopkins University. His scholarship and teaching are focused on racial inequality in U.S. society. In 2009, Dr. Spence received the Excellence in Teaching Award from Johns Hopkins. In 2010, he received an arts innovation grant to fund a course that combines black politics and documentary photography. Dr. Spence published his first book, Stare in the Darkness, The Limits of Hip Hop and Black Politics in June 2011. At this time, please silence all cell phones and electronic devices. Please hold all questions until the question and answer session, which will follow tonight's lecture. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lester Spence. Um, first of all, I want to thank I want to thank uh, the Clark Forum for inviting me. Uh, I want to thank the staff for providing for me, and I um, particularly want to thank um, Professor Vanessa Tyson for inviting me. She, her work is uh, there are a number of scholars who are doing incredibly important work uh, to talk about kind of racial politics in the 21st century, and Professor Tyson is among them. It's very rare that we get a kind of a public opportunity to express our appreciation and our um, respect for our colleagues, and I want to do so now. Uh, you know what, do me a favor, stand up so everybody can celebrate you. There are a few other academics in the room, so um, the students might not quite understand. What we are and what we do is, uh, we're so wrapped up in our work and if you, whether an academic article or an academic book or some type of academic project, much of what we do is a matter of, of endurance, of consistently enduring criticism, right? Of, of, you know, you send out an article, reject. You send it out, reject. You send it out, revise and resubmit. You resubmit it, reject. You resubmit, reject. And in that process, you know, by the time we finally get something out, it's really more a product of kind of, of, like I said, endurance, right? So very rarely do we actually get somebody to say, like, wow, thank you, we love you for who you are, like off the rip, right? Like off the rip. So I needed to do that. It's really important we do that. And to the extent that you as students are dealing with that type of dynamic or know somebody dealing with that type of dynamic, particularly at the end of the year when you have finals upon you, take the time to reach out and tell somebody you appreciate them. You under, I, I know you guys are under, some of you are under a great deal of stress and a great deal of pressure, and it's really important to actually affirm people from a place of honesty and integrity. That opens up your heart and opens up your imagination, and you do not know and understand and fully appreciate the effect that that type of thing can have. Right? Now with that said, i written something out, or I created kind of a sketch of an outline about what I want to talk about today. And I'm going to rely on those remarks, but I realized that at a place like Dickinson, 
we have the opportunity with the Trayvon Martin case to talk about something that elite universities increasingly have to deal with. So what I'm gonna do, that, so these remarks aren't really scripted, and then I'm gonna try to go back to my more or less scripted or organized remarks. I, um, last year, I got an email from one of my students, and she told me she had witnessed in the library an act of uh, racial profiling. She saw one of her fellow students call the police on a black male student in the library and then saw Hopkins, student, uh, Hopkins police interrogate that student only to let him free when they realized he was supposed to be there, right? And if you think about, you know, thinking about that incident, right? So this, the simple story with that incident is that that student had, had what we think of um, at best of perhaps racially insensitive attitudes. At most you think maybe she had implicit or explicit uh, racist attitudes, and she used, and the attitudes in that moment drove her to uh, call the police on this individual, right? And we can, like, kind of end it there. But the reality is, is there's a richer story, right? So from the moment Hopkins freshmen enter the campus, they're uh, given basically a lecture by both a combination of of, um, of upperclassmen and administrators, including like RAs and the like, telling them where the dangerous spaces are, right? And then there are a series of technologies on campus that ask students to identify things that are not, that uh, people and objects that are out of place. Now, arguably, I've only been there since 2004, so it's possible that this dynamic is a post-9-11 thing, right? It's possible. But whatever the case, there are now a series of devices and technologies that cause people, including cameras, that cause people to, to look at the, their campus with certain eyes to identify, are they supposed to be here or not? Are they supposed to be here or not? Are they supposed to be here or not? Right? Now this, sort, this sorting process doesn't work the exact same way for everybody. So while there was a moment, perhaps maybe 20 years ago, where if I, being the age I am now, would be on campus, I would fall under this sort, I no longer fall under this sort. Right? I, I, in fact, I was telling Andrew, um, Andrew brought me to campus, there, um, like, I, he could have told me how to get here and I could have walked here on my own. You guys would have recognized that I didn't belong here, but you wouldn't have reacted as an antibody does to a virus. You'd just be like, oh, who's, who's that guy? Who's that adult, right? But there, are but there are bodies who get a different treatment. So imagine that you're in the library studying. You know, you're, you're just preparing for, for finals, right? And then all of a sudden, the police come to you and ask you if you're supposed to be here. Right? And they have the law on their side. Hopkins police officers actually are deputized. They carry weapons. Right? Now you're there to study. That's the only reason why you're there. The only reason why you're, why you're here is to study. Right? The only reason. That's a place where it's designed for you to study. Imagine every time. No, no, not quite every time, because it doesn't happen that often. But imagine it just happening once or twice. How are you going to deal in those spaces, right? Are you going to be able to look at your book the same way? Are you going to be able to study calculus the same way? Are you going to be able to work on that political science paper with the same degree of kind of focus and attention? Or are you going to have to simultaneously navigate yourself and figure out, am I wearing the right clothes? Is my hat turned the right way? Is my hair the right way? Right? Am I sitting up straight? Right? Do I look like I'm supposed to be here? And then on top of that, studying. Right? On top of that, studying. Right? So how might we use that dynamic, that technology approach, to analyze the Trayvon Martin case? So we know a number of details about the Trayvon Martin case. There's some stuff we don't know. Right? But we know that... Um, on oh, February 27th, 
Was it 27th or 26th? Where's Leah? 26. February 26th, he was going to the convenience store, what, we, we, what I call growing up the party store. He went to the party store to pick up some Skittles and some Arizona iced tea. He had a party store. You know, you don't realize how funny that stuff sounds until you, you know, until you grow up, right? Like some people call it different things. We, in Detroit, we call it a party store. So we, he's on his way to the party store, um, and he picked up some Skittles and some um, iced tea. We know that uh, George Zimmerman, who's a, a, a neighborhood watch volunteer in, um, in, the, in the retreat, the gated community, I'm gonna talk about that later, identified him and called 911 dispatch saying that he'd seen somebody suspicious. We know that they asked him not to, not to, uh, um, not to follow um, Martin. We know he disobeyed that order. Um, then after that, something happens. We know that Martin calls his girlfriend and they have a conversation. And then we know that, um, that Zimmerman kills him with a registered handgun, right? On top of that, we know that Zimmerman declares self-defense under the Stand Your Ground law. And we know that it takes approximately a week to two weeks before the case becomes part of our national dialogue. And then, it, and then a few weeks happen, a few weeks, three to four weeks after that, Zimmerman's finally charged, right? What else do we know? We know that when, when the incident first happened, they checked Martin's body for drugs, but didn't check Zimmerman at all. They gave him kind of a medical analysis to make sure he was okay, but they didn't, he didn't have an alcohol test, he didn't have a drug test. That's kind of the framework of what we know, right? Now again, how, now, what I want to do is kind of talk about this post-racial moment before I get to the, I'm going to talk about the post-racial moment, this con kind of contemporary condition. Then I'm going to kind of defining my terms. I'm going to talk about what politics is. And then I'm going to kind of use that to interrogate the case, kind of starting with what we know.